there, my name's Jill Tiny, I'm from Collaboration Global, and this is our podcast, Being Human, Hidden Depths. I'm going to be interviewing some of our members from Collaboration Global, and they're going to be sharing with you their extraordinary lives. Although they would probably believe they're just normal, everyday, average humans, but they are extraordinary. A bit like you and me, we all have our story to tell. We've all been through difficult times and we've come out the other end having learned an extraordinary amount about ourselves that we can share with others. So I think you'll find lots of things that will resonate with where you've been in your journey as well. I look forward to seeing you on the other side. And welcome to the podcast, Being Human, Hidden Depths. My name is Jill Tiny, and our organization is Collaboration Global. And normally on Collaboration Global, we would be talking to one of our members. But today on the last uh, podcast of 2020, after this incredible year, we're breaking the rules. So we have Andrew Priestley. I'm so pleased to say I've got nabbed him. I've got the man, Andrew Priestley, who I have admired for many years. We go back probably about 10 years now. Um, so welcome, Andrew. Lovely to have you here on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's great. It, it's great. And, you know, we could have had a podcast before the podcast, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> We've got to bring back all that gold dust and start yeah, all over yeah, again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah all, the, all that gold dust, yeah. And, and, look, it's not lost on me that uh, that you normally talk to people within your network and you 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 dig deep and, and find out who they are because it's, it's a very relational space that you're in. We want to know who you are and what you stand for and... So it's, I'm really touched that you've asked me to come in as an outsider and chat. Thank you. And also before before we started, we were talking about all the different things and you went, oh, no biggies then, just my purpose. (laughs) (laughs) But before we start, we do have to tell this story. So I was just funning and going, I was going to have a plain background and I thought, oh, let's have a little, um, you know, uh, a background um, that means something to me. So I found this one, which is my, my happy place. And Andrew recognized it immediately. So tell us a story about your dad briefly about St. Ives. Well, it, it's, it's actually, it's, it's not necessarily my dad, it's more my mum. And so St. Ives, the, the, the story of what you're looking at there, if you have a look at the background there, right, you're looking at the western side of, of the UK. And as Jill moved out the way there, you can see the harbour, the St. Sin- Ives Harbour. And it, it's tidal, so it goes in and out, and you can actually walk almost up to the break point there. Mm. Um, but uh, in the Second World War, my grandfather was in crew, and he actually worked for British Railways, and he was in charge of scheduling all of the train movements for the troopies. The reason he got the job was because his handwriting was so beautiful. Uh-huh. Right? And I look, at, I look at his handwriting today, and there's, you know, I, I'm such a terrible writer. I, I should have been a doctor. <laughs> that bad yeah it's that yeah. bad right um and uh so he his handwriting is beautiful and, and if i've looked at stuff that my mum had for example from my grandfather it's just wonderful it was an age when they really took care in their handwriting and mm-hmm. you know what jill i've started writing letters again oh lovely yeah i've actually started writing letters and sending people letters and in fact there's one there where is it it's it's I'll show if I can find it. I'll I'll show it to you. I'll race off and get it because I, <laughs> I've, I've decided to really personalise them. Anyway, my grandfather would schedule the trains, and uh, and as a reward, he was allowed to take his family on summer holidays. And the train line went from Crew all the way down to St Ives, and it terminates just behind your head there. Yeah. And there's a hotel, and there's a there's, there's actually the harbour, and then there's another little beach, which is a beautiful beach, right? Yeah. And uh, so down, if you walk down through the village, which is a delightful little village in itself, right, mm-hmm. just on the corner, right on the head, which overlooks the harbour and it overlooks the beach is St Andrew's Church, which I'm named after. Oh. Because mum used to go down there. I've got this glorious photo of mum walking down the street in St Ives with her with her Coke bottle glasses and her, <laughs> and her tin hat. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> right? And her gas mask and all that yeah. sort of stuff, right? <clears throat> Wow, you should um, have that safe for your grandchildren. Like, yeah. bring it, put it on the wall. Yeah, well, I've got, it is, and and that that in itself is another story. But um, <laughs> but uh, mum passed in two thousand and seven, and I was I thought I'm going to take a sabbatical in in two thousand and eight, and I thought I've got to go to St Ives. I've got to go and have a look at that, right? And mm. I don't know what it was, but maybe it was because it's the stories I grew up with, my mum. But I I 
I, I don't see dead people, but I know that she popped in for a walk with me on St Ives Beach, right? I oh, know that she was there, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So it's 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 a really special place for me too, Jill. I I I, I stood on that beach down there, looking at the 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 harbour bay there, and yeah, I, I, yeah there you go. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's beautiful. And I know I had a tear for mum. I had a lot of tears. For mm. mum. It was lovely, yeah. Mm. And so it's a very special place. And so I'm looking at this, and I'm going, my God, I know that place. <laughs> as, <laughs> as soon as I saw it, so yeah. It just it was meant to be, wasn't it? And it yeah, is that yeah. kind of thing that. It is like a, a magical space, um, yeah. and it's the minute you go into that space that you breathe that air, you can smell that sea. Yeah. Oh, everything just kind of calms down. And I was telling you earlier that it's my happy place. So all of my big decisions around my life have been made in Cornwall, um, and I've got family down there as well. So it is, uh, and presumably you've been to the Minac Theatre as well. We could talk about um, Cornwall for a long time, I'm sure, but I'm going to rewind it now, <clears throat> take it back a little bit. And just remind you, which you probably don't know, how I yeah. first met you. So do you remember back in the day of Intrivo yep. when you were putting on lots of events? And I went to one of your events. I don't know how I came across it. Um, and it was all about money. So in my head, put you in that box, money man, which is great. Um, and it didn't necessarily work for me because I'm not a money person. <laughs> if I've got it, I spend it. If I haven't got it, I don't worry about it. So I'm not driven by targets and money. And do you want to earn this much to have a six figure salary? I'm like, yeah. OK, <laughs> but from there, I, I met your son and from there I got involved with KPI, the uh, Key Post of Influence program. But what touched me on that day in that Mermaid Theatre, the very first time I was finding out about what's all this KPI stuff about? I walked through the door and I noticed that this man had been on the stage about two weeks before talking to us about money, was behind the counter taking people's coats and giving them little raffle tickets for it. And I'm like, that's great. And then I noticed that... Um, um, your daughter was there and your wife was there and some other members of the family were there. And I just looked around and went, wow, this is a family operation. This is doing it for the love of getting something off the ground. We knew it was fairly new. We knew it wasn't um, the kind of um, something that had been going for donkey's years that we all needed to get involved in. It was something we were part of something that was exciting and, oh, what if, and let's try this out. Um, and I remember... Um, not sure whether to go for it or not, like you do. Uh, and I, we left, uh, me and my husband, and we sat down and we talked about it. He said, let's not talk about it for us today. Let's have a nice day in London and we'll come back and decide if you're going to do it or not. Uh, but I kept coming back to it and kept coming back to it. And he's like, oh, for goodness sake. I said, well, if you were me, what would you do? He said, well, I would have signed up before I left the theatre. What are you worried about? Okay. <laughs> so then I rang up to say, can I, can I do this? And you picked the phone up uh, and you answered me and you gave me all that. And he said, well, if, if you think you haven't got time now, when will you have time? And it was the best decision ever made. I got in there and that was, I don't know how many years, like KPI 3, what's that? Um, 10 yeah. years ago now? 2011, 2012 maybe. And because of you, so many great people have been in my life. So you obviously through Daniel, through the KPI community, but lots of other things along the way. And one of the other things I've got to say thank you for now publicly is getting me involved with this. It, you can't see it too clearly, but this is a collaboration and on the back are all the people that we collaborated with. So you instigated this book of love. And I got involved because it's like, I want to see what it's like to collaborate with a bunch of people I do not know at all. Yeah. But what brought us together, what made it beautiful, and I don't know about you, but it was smooth as anything. From outside looking in, it was a breeze. I think we've lost Andrew on the visual at the moment. Can you still hear me, Andrew? Yeah, I can. I can. It's for okay. whatever reason. Just keep talking. Okay. <laughs> it's all right. For those people that are audio, uh, you don't know any different. That's fine. Um, so I was still, I was look, I was interested to see how this was work, but I do believe that because it was a book of love, because we were talking about love and we were practicing love and we were being love, it was a dream. It worked really, really well. So for my third book, it, it kind of was, um, okay, that's how you do it. So I learned so much from that whole experience of how to put um, a collaboration together when the essence is from the right place. So thank you for probably I've known you for about 10 years I don't know it's roughly then but um you've been in the background and I've been in your background for a long time but we've kept bumping into each other and I was um pleased to attend your 60th birthday party honestly I can't believe it was your 60th but anyway we had a, a nice time over at the eight club which was really good fun and we ended up having a good natter at the end mm -hmm. so I want to take so personal thank you from me to you but also I want to find out now I admire your family. I admire the 
patriarch that you are for your family and they obviously respect and love you very, very much. But what was your life like when you were eight years old? When you first started going, oh, this is what the world is all about. This is what I'm good at. This is what I love doing. This is what I want my life to be. You kind of eight years of age, you're kind of thinking like anything's possible because you haven't quite learned or you haven't had people tell you, you can't do that, we can do that. <laughs> can't. You're at this stage where anything's possible. What was Andrew Priestley like at eight years of age? Um, the short answer is I was a bright little boy. No surprise right. there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, was a, I was a bright, a bright little a bright little boy who spent a lot of time you, you, you're talking about a time look, isn't it funny you mentioned that because look look what i found whoa the 60s <laughs> songs, songs that shape the depth, depth of life. <laughs> amazing songs the soundtrack of my life but um I spent a lot of time outside, right? I was of that generation where you got up in the morning, you had breakfast and it was get outside I'm yeah. growing up in Australia. And I spent a lot of time outside. We wouldn't do that with kids now. No, it's a shame. Right? It? Uh, when I was six, I think I was down with in the days when they used to deliver milk by horse and cart. And I used oh. to go down and feed the horse and muck out, muck out the Fantastic. horse. Right? right? And I think I got thruppence. Wow. For, for doing that right and i would go and buy some humbugs and stuff like that but i spent a lot of time me and my brother we spent a lot of time outside and we climbed stuff and we got into a lot of mischief and things like that um uh, it's a good question you ask it's a really because eight eight is particularly interesting time time period for me because a bit of context my dad was a decorated war hero Okay, so he's got medals. Yeah, right. right. Um, he saw campaigns in, in, you know where I'm going with this. He saw campaigns in, in, uh, in Europe and he then was in, in uh, Egypt, wow. North <clears> Africa. <throat> and then he was seconded into the Palestine police force in what is now Israel. So it was Palestine. Wow. So he was yeah. there from 1942 to 1948. In fact, he was in the last detail that actually handed over Palestine to the Israeli government on May 15, 1948, Oof. right? Mm. Um, uh, I spent probably six months chatting with him. Every week I'd go and have a chat with him. Well, probably when I was in my 40s, I would go and have dinner with him and mm. every week we'd get out the photo album. He pulled out photos, particularly of his war experience, which he'd never shown anyone or ever talked mm -hmm. about. Mm. And... And I was actually completing, I'd actually gone back as a mature age student and completed my uh, psych degree. I did an industrial organizational psychology degree. I majored in abnormal psychology. Oh. Um, uh, uh, it's funny what I have to research these days because I still get execs who have addictions and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he <laughs> shared that story with me, right? He shared his stories with me. Mm. I realise now he probably suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Awesome. Yeah. Right? yeah. So for me as an eight-year-old, I was I spent my time keeping off his radar. Yeah. So, so as an eight-year-old, I'm a happy kid, but I'm a hyper-vigilant kid. Yeah. Right. So what? Uh, and he wasn't he wasn't necessarily violent, but I would say that he'd probably seen a lot. That that something happened to me when I was seven or eight which changed my life oh, around my father, which yeah. I still find very hard to talk about. I had a lot of counselling about it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, which made me decide to stay right out of his orbit. Right. right. So for me, I had a very happy childhood away from the home. Right? Right. So, so I was out playing and doing stuff like that. Right? Um, I have a lot of compassion for him now. Yeah, at the time it was self-preservation, probably wasn't totally, it? Totally, um, yeah. yeah. And 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 what I learned was that it's it's yeah the happy kid software is you're exploring the world, and I was doing that right. But yeah. what I'm learning about family was another thing, right? Christmas time not a good time for me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the way I, I understand it is you write a bit of software about how the world works, right? And, mm -hmm. you, and for me, you know, you get to a point like I got to the age of seven and something happened and I wrote some software about life software, about how life works. Yeah. And as you said, it's self-preservation software. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, the the, the way the brain works is marvelous, and that it, it's it's mo is to keep you safe. It's to keep yeah. you you know to keep you on track there, right? Yeah. And um. And that's how I thought the world worked. Mm, Because you assume that's what everybody's going through, don't you? Um, Uh, Totally, totally. That's that's incredibly astute. You you just do assume this is how other things. Mm. And so so the long and short of it was I get to about 43 and I hit a wall with it. That software runs out of bandwidth. It runs Mm. out of bandwidth. And so a lot of pause for thought when I turned 43, right? But, but when I was seven or eight, you know, I'd, I've got lots of happy memories of my, my brother and I getting up to whole sorts of stuff. But at the back of it was, it, it's my home life. I'm staying away from home as much as possible. Yeah. So, um, hated Christmas. Yeah. Absolutely hated Christmas. Right? Just just want, did not want to be there. And so fast forward to when I'm 18, I'm now doing, you know, the, the trajectory I'm on, I'm doing stupid stuff. By the time I'm 16, 15, 16, I'm drinking, mm-hmm. I'm doing all that sort of crazy stuff. Um, you know, I remember walking down a highway, totally smashed off my face on green ginger wine and, and uh, Southern Comfort and stupid Ooh. stuff like that. Driving. That would have been a bad hangover. Ugh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but I had this girlfriend at the time who I used to go to her house and we didn't end up we, we realized we were better mates than boyfriend and girlfriend if you know what I mean so yeah. I, and I love their family and they and they, I remember it was in the days Jill when you could when no one locked their front door I know yeah right long time so, ago long time yeah, a long ago. time ago yeah so I walk into this house several times two o'clock in the morning I'm going there I'm off my face crashed on the couch right and i remember i wake up in the morning and my shoes are off i've got a pillow and i've got a rug on oh. but somebody's obviously gotten up yeah right? and then uh, uh jenny's dad doug i just remember the conversation he said oh, he said dad mate drinking's not a good thing mate mm-hmm. right? not a good thing you just need someone to tell you, don't you? And yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, especially, he said, if you're going out with my daughter, he said, drink is not a good thing. <laughs> Even if you're friends with her, it's not a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, he said, you're on a, on a bad road there. And as the way Aussies say it, you're on a bad road there. Okay? And um, so, uh, so what came out of that was Christmas time. Suddenly, I'm, this is around Christmas time. Right. So I'm fighting the demons anyway. And then mm-hmm. suddenly... You know, Jen's aunts and uncles are there and Doug's there and Pat's there and the piano's playing and I'm, I'm shyly off in the corner and then bit by bit over several Christmases, I'm bang, I'm into it. Right? And, Lovely. you know, people show up in your life who, without being too much, they change your life. And Doug's one of those guys who just who just turned the Christmas gene back on. Yeah, that's right? amazing. And, turned on my gene about fatherhood right right and about being a good parent and about growing up yeah being a dad's grown-ups work right it's grown-ups work looking after your money is grown-ups work yeah you know what you and i do is grown-ups work it's not we say oh it's adult it's not because you and i both know adults who chronologically have got an adult age who are just kids masquerading as adults absolutely yeah right so what we do is adults work but um yeah so that's what I was doing. Mm-hmm. It's a long story. It's a long answer to, to your question. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what? It really sets you up for um, the relationship that you currently have with your family. Oh, and easily, easily. The, the wonderful heart on the sleeve respect they have for you and what you do. Um, and it, there is no, I mean, obviously families go through their ups and downs, but um, yeah. it's a bit like me. I've got two daughters and um, up to the age of about 18 months I wasn't a very good mum because I'm not good with babies but as soon as they could talk <laughs> we were fine yeah. and and throughout their life me and my husband would say to each other oh you know they're supposed to have the terrible twos but we haven't had that I wonder this must be like a honeymoon period it's going to happen soon and then they'd get to school and we're like oh well this is a honeymoon period because now they're at school they're going to get in, in with friends and they're going to change and then all of a sudden they were teenagers and we're like oh it's going to be terrible you know the Kevin syndrome is going to happen they're going to be awful and never happened never happened never happened and I look back I think the reason it didn't happen is because we were all in it together and we communicated with each other and we talked and when times Mm. were tough when it was either financially tough or physically tough or somebody was going through a terrible time or whatever 
we spoke to each other. And on occasion, I remember the girls coming and going, can we go to this party? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And I do, so I sit down and say, hey, guys, I haven't got the rule book for this. My head is saying one thing. My heart is saying something else. My head is saying, why can't they go? And my heart is going, no way. I've got to keep you indoors. You're never going to go to that party. What are we going to compromise on? And they would help me to be a better mother. Mm. And they would help me to make wise choices because we collaborated and we talked about it on a regular basis. And I get the impression with your family, just from the outside looking in, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but you can see this massive mutual respect for each other that has been born from your experiences. You have created the culture within your family. Yeah, I think they get most of the good stuff from their mum, though. So. <laughs> well, that's honest. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm honest, right? Um, yeah, but I mean, but, you know, I'm, I, I, it's also a decision point. And a decision point for me was that I'm going to be a good dad. Yeah. Right? And mm-hmm. and it was, it, you know, it, it was the days when, you know, I was... 21 when I became a parent right and we don't have those days like that now but I thought god I was so grown up at 21 and 21's a kid now right yeah 31's a kid right 21 was a kid and I was a parent at 22 right and I loved it yeah I loved it from the get-go you know the day my son was born I stopped smoking for example oh well done and I and the drinking stopped and things like that so all the bad stuff stopped and you know and 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 I decided, no, I'm just going to just, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'll just try and be a good dad, right? Yeah. And um, and I'm not, and it's it's funny because some people go, I had a terrible upbringing and I'm going to be a terrible upbringing as well. I just model the wrong stuff. And sometimes yeah. you go, that was terrible. And then you pause and think, what could I do differently? And it's 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 that thing about intention. You're, something bigger than you is, an, is your intention, you know? And and mm-hmm. that feeds down to your identity of, you know, I'm a good dad. That's a pretty solid dad. And and the word good disappeared to I'm going to be a loving dad. Oh, perfect. Right? Yeah. 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 From good yeah. to loving, you know, loving dad. So so both my kids know their dad loves them. Yeah. Right. And, you know, uh, Dan rings up still and he says, oh, dad, I just I need a hug. You know, I say, oh. right. Yep. So I'll go around and have a chat. I want to. I want to debrief. I want to. I want to chat about stuff. And he doesn't want me to be a coach. No. Nope. He doesn't want me to be a business person. He just That's wants me to your, shut up your, and listen. Yeah. You, he just wants you to be a dad. Yeah, yeah. But but yeah. what you said before was really true. Is that um, uh, isn't it interesting? The journey is there's all these fears, and I had all these fears. Am I doing this right? I mean, you know, there was no playbook, right? Mm. But but ultimately, the playbook was values, and I think. I think that, you know, uh, Diane and I shared s- the same values about family and about how we wanted to do stuff. And even mm. though we made mistakes, the values didn't change, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, so subsequently, I'll give an example of that, right? Um, subsequently, our kids, I think, you know, it wasn't perfect, that's for sure, right? Because um, mm-hmm. both, both Diane and I are fiery people and we love a stouch, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and if you could just say yes to something, no, let's argue about it. It's more fun just to argue, right? <laughs> right? So we like a stash, but mm. but it's not malicious. If no, you know what I mean, right? It's no. not malicious, right? So, um, but to give you an example of that, uh, you you know your kids are teaching you stuff, right? Uh, and That's I remember, the, yeah. I remember when when Dan doing the teenage thing was going out with his mates and drinking and stuff like that as they do at that yeah. impressionable age, right? And I can remember he, he and his mates came home one night and and they were all trashed. And I said, who drove? Ooh. And one of the guys said, I did. And I said, okay, okay. So I said, look, guys, I want this agreement with you, right? If, if you go to a party and you're hammered, ring me and I'll come and get you. I don't care where you are, <laughs> what time of the night is, I'll come and get you. And yep. I promise I will never complain. Right. That's the deal. Right? Yeah, yeah. So they put it to the test. <laughs> <laughs> the next weekend, I get a phone call at half past two in the morning. Dad, can you come and get me? <laughs> and and just that is a heartwarming thing that your yeah. son goes, I can trust my dad to come and get me. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I, I would so, always do that with my kids as well, definitely. Yeah, see, I didn't get that. Mm. See, I didn't get that. You know, if you're on your own, you're on your own. Sort it out. So I'm walking down a highway, blind, drunk, mm. cars zipping past me. You know, any moment, God, you know, 
that's the miracle that I talked about before. It's a miracle that I that I survived that. Um, so I went and got them. And there's a story about my mum, which I want to share in a moment. But mm. I went, I went and got them, and uh, they are they are hammered. Right? <laughs> they made the most of it. <laughs> yes, they, did. they probably well, decided getting... to ring you up beforehand. Yeah, and went, hey, yeah, we're, we're getting picked up. Let's just just go real. Let's really go at this, right? <laughs> um, anyway, I picked them up, and uh, we're driving back. And the the expected happens. One of them throws up in the car. Right? Oh no! Did you not take back? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we get back to the house. I put the, I put them down in the, the in the playroom downstairs. Yeah. The playroom. They're all blanketed up. there. you know, I'm, I come there. I've got a pillow. I've got a blanket. See how the sur- the story cycles back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They got the pillow yeah. and the blanket. You know, and uh, and. I am boy, I'm ropeable at this point. I'm livid at this point. I'm going, you are in trouble. And we were told not to swear on this show, right? Yeah. Um, so it's now four o'clock in the morning and I've cleaned the car out. So mm. I, I can't leave this guy. So I've, I, I'm there. So how about five in the morning? I'm finally finished cleaning this car up. Mm-hmm. Right? And uh, then the boys get up at about half past 10. So I go back to bed. I wake up at half past 10. I'm making some bacon and eggs and some toast. And the boys get up. Do you want breakfast? Da, da, da. Mm-hmm. We have breakfast, coffee, boom, off they go. And then um, it may not be the exact words, but Dan said something like, um, aren't you going to tell me off? I said, no, what was our deal? Mm-hmm. He said, yeah. And he said, well, we were talking about it. We all felt guilty because you didn't yell at us, right? but you stuck to your agreement. Yeah. Right? You yep. stuck to your agreement. Right? Um, subsequently, the next time, the boys then came around and they said, look, we've talked about it. We've decided when we go to a party, we're going to have a designated driver. Yeah, it's not difficult, is it? <laughs> no. And so that's how they did it. Right? Yeah. And so they Brilliant. could trust me and I could trust them. Yeah, you have to build that trust, definitely. Yeah. I do so, blame you slightly for that, Andrew, because you should have either chucked their heads out the window or, or given them a bag. That would have been a lot easier. But I, I've know, done, I know. I've You're done similar in things. Hindsight, Jill. You're wise <laughs> in hindsight. Yeah. I've done so, similar things with my kids when then they yeah. they kind of used to come around for the pre lash, you know, yeah. and then they go off to a club. And at one point they were they gone to a and about five miles down the road uh, a club, and then I got a phone call about eleven o'clock saying we're trying to get in this club and they won't let. Uh, I can't remember Seb in because he was, I mean, six foot four, yeah. but he was too drunk. And so I had to go and pick him up at 11 yeah. uh, and then bring him back and put him to bed. Um, and then in the morning, he was absolutely mortified. I'm so sorry. I did that. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That was okay. You know, I'd rather that than you'd been sat outside for two hours waiting for them to. The, the reality is that young people get in cars and they think they're bulletproof and, and they're not. We've all done it. We've yeah, all done we've it. All, I, hey, guilty is charged more than most, right? So, so th- that's the miracle I'm talking about. You know, how did I get from A to B and not even remember the trip and I'm blind drunk and behind a wheel? I mean, how irresponsible is that? And, mm. you know, that played on me uh, in, in 2003, I've completed my psych degree right? and my, my reward for completing my psych degree and they didn't give it away, folks. It was hard work. It was really hard graft, right? Um, I end up in... Uh, as a an observer intern if you like in a mm-hmm. rehab center in in uh, sydney right? right and you get put into a circle group of about eight people and i think i'm there to observe you know i've got a pretty good life i'm da 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 no you have none of that none of that right um none of that and i'm mm-hmm. talking about people who are who are right on the bones of their asses as, as low down as you can get in yeah. broken right down the bottom there right and they have having none of this hey you show up being better than us and so you really had to dig in that's when i that's when i had the oh my software just ran out moment yeah. trying yeah. to upgrade my software yeah. um but yeah it's it's values is a big part of it you know like and and like what you said before it's a collaborative effort you're mucking together yeah and i know people who don't talk to the kids i know i know oh it's teenagers what can you do um you talk to them uh, don't talk to them and and see see it's teenagers what can you do so that's part of the thinking you know there's a thinking i can't do this so the word can't is really really important because it tips to your belief systems yeah when you say i can't do something can't means i don't want to give myself permission to yeah right yeah oh it's an excuse it's just and it's a trapdoor 
Mm. It's your it's your get out of jail card free, right? It's my oh I can't, so therefore I don't have to think about it. That means I then don't have to confront it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's exactly so. So you know, when I'm executing exec coaching, I've got someone who says, you know, we turn over twenty nine million, we turn over one hundred and forty four million. I can't do that. I said, really, <laughs> really? Let's explore that, right? Let's just um, yeah, put pause on that, put a little pin in that, and let's have a look at it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So. So, so when yeah, you that's, look, that's important. When you look back on your life now, yeah. uh, and as you say, you can see this kind of full circle thing. Now, in Collaboration Global, we talk a lot about people having um, the genius within them that needs to be explored because there is a purpose. Everyone has their purpose. And some people haven't quite nailed it and haven't found it or it's, it's there, but they're not really sure. They're not sure what they're good at necessarily. But I'm, I'm really good at that, but I don't like doing that. So I, I'm, what do I love doing? I'm not, And it's all kind of fluffy. And we, we focus on legacy in the point of you are here as a human being for a damn good reason. And that reason is why you've been given your genius. And that genius is part of your purpose. So how are you going to utilize that? Do not waste your time on this planet because you are here for a damn good reason. So what you've just talked about is going full circle. And it's almost like you've been given the breadcrumbs to pick up and learn from in order to do something. Now, I know earlier you were talking about um, the charity that you support. And I would imagine a big part of your purpose is around that. So would you like to explain, you know, what, what you consider in yeah. this life, in this world, in this time you have on this planet, Andrew, yeah. basically, what's your purpose? Um, it, it, the answer that's two, twofold, again, um, your purpose, right, is to be a good human being. Damn right. Okay, period. It's to love people. That's yeah. your purpose, right? I don't care. The, 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 the the external thing is make money and do blah, 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 right? But I know people who've made a lot of money and they've got everything God would send them and give them, pass it mm. up, mm -hmm. and they're still empty. Yeah. Right? Their, their kids hate them. Their wives don't like them. It's tragic. Yeah. yeah what right? mm. So, you, you know, for me, if, if I could give you an activity, think of it like this. This is, this is a really good activity to do later, right? Think of it like this. We all play different roles throughout our life, right? And... Mm -hmm. There's lots of roles we have. Pick eight. Pick eight roles that okay. you know that you consistently show up in, right? We're, we're talking about purpose. Right. right. So father, brother, uh, cousin, mm -hmm. friend, <coughs> business coach, blah, 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 whatever it is. Just there's mm -hmm. lots of roles, but pick eight. And pick the eight where you show up a lot. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm constantly doing dad role, right? And this goes through seasons. I do less of dad and I do more of yeah. grandparent now. Right? Yeah. So the roles change, right? Out of that, nail it down to the three that really showed up this year. Mm. Right? So for me, it was um, dad slash grandparent. Yeah. Right? Friend. Coach. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Perfect. your purpose is usually going to be circling around the things that you're doing on a regular basis, right? The, the, the trick is that I've got to change the world, change your world. Yes. Right? It's a big, and then big the difference. ripples go out. Yeah. yeah. Because I know people who are trying to change that world and their own personal world is not mm. that good, right? And I speak yes. from experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, I love my dad and he was... A very well respected man this is a man who was in the middle east who had unlimited access to the uh, to the al sharif in jerusalem mm. now for a british guy to have access to the the most holy sh islamic shrine on the planet mm -hmm. right right yeah. so he learned and he spoke fluent arabic and hebrew wow right so this is a man who then went on a religious journey to try and figure out what the hell happened during this conflict. And he was yeah. very well respected for that. Um, things weren't too good at home. See, his world was amazing, but his personal world wasn't. And yeah. maybe that's the thing I've got to be grateful to for my dad. That's what I, you know, he, he taught me some good lessons, right? Mm. So it's not that world, it's your world. Right. So pick the three, the three things. It sounds like I threw my dad under a bus, doesn't it? But I love it. No, that. no. It's, it, it's that learning curve, isn't it? Because you, you, you were not responsible as a child for no. what your parent is having to cope no. with and no. having to deal no. with. And he deals with it in the only way he yeah. knows how. Yeah. And it's like 
my mum had issue, issues along the way and I can point to many things as because yeah, yeah. she said that or did that I was damaged and this yeah, was your yeah. problem but when I look at her life as she grew up it's like yeah. I would never have survived what she went through and no, she was no. doing the only thing she knew how so she was protecting herself and yeah. doing what she thought was good for me by protecting me too much as it turned out it, it's a hard thing to realize that when my dad went there he was 24 you think 24 year old right you're in charge of a a machine gun at the age of 24 yeah and sidearms right um so pick the three roles Mm -hmm. whatever it is it's usually ones you're going to be as a starting point it's not the answer but it's it's a good orient starting point pick the three key roles so for me Mm. it was father slash grandparent friend and coach that's how i showed up a lot last year and this year and then decide what's what's a word and I usually get my clients to draw a circle mm-hmm. and to write words in there of words that if you wanted to describe yourself, things that you're comfortable describing. So I put down loving, kind, generous, knowledgeable, blah, blah, blah. Just fill up with this circle with different, different words. Yeah. And one of those words is going to jump out at you. Yes. And the word that jumped out at me was not smart, clever, but it was loving. Mm. So loving coach, loving friend loving parent slash grandparent mm. grandparent mm. Right? so then it gets you to think what would that look like showing up that's the purpose so the purpose for me was very much about loving right mm. the extended purpose is is if i look at themes going back right through my life what's been meaningful and i've already why i told those stories to you today is because i'm the chairman of a children's charity clear sky children's charity mm. that looks after the welfare of children age four to 12 it's no accident my first job was a school teacher in a remote country school where i'm looking after the welfare of children age four to 12 irony not lost on me right and Mm. i saw a lot of stuff around children's welfare in a country remote country area stuff that you know you you've got no one to deal with but you you're you are the the thing i've seen i've been stuff that just make your hair curl yeah um so the the charity is really important to me mm. um, because right now we've got, because of COVID, we've got a spike in domestic violence and uh, we're dealing with kids who are referred by the school system uh, because they're dis- there's safeguarding issues and they're deemed, they're deemed vulnerable and they've mm. either witnessed or they've directly experienced a trauma. So if you want to donate something to Clear Sky Children's Charity, I'd love that. Um, mm. So that's really really important to me i think welfare of people is a passion of mine the welfare so it it in it shaped and informed teaching i've always thought how do i be a really good teacher and at the heart of it was i want to be really caring and i want to give i want to make really complex information simple for people to understand mm. right incidentally that little activity i gave you when you pick your three roles and you say because you're not just one role you're several identities but three is one you can get your head around and yeah. loving ties them all together it's the thing that unifies it yeah right um so uh we talk about sorry go on no i was just going to say making stuff making stuff easy for people to understand is a caring sort of thing anyway so maybe i was a caring teacher at one point so it goes through seasons and iterations yeah 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 um yeah what one of the things we talk about again at collaboration global is who are you being yeah and and rather than doing you know, we, we can all um, do the business stuff. Uh, it's just going through the motions, but it's who are you being? So our values at Collaboration Global are uh, love. Yeah. So we want people to be love because from there, everything can be achieved and human being first. And the philosophy behind that uh, is, and people have heard me say this many, many times, but I do not apologize for repeating it, is that we don't care how much you earn. We don't care what you do for a living. Yeah. We don't care um, what... Um, keeps you up at night what we're caring about <clears throat> is that you're a human being first we don't care if you're black or white or tall or short or fat or thin or gay or straight old or young whatever or sexual orientation <coughs> australian or even <laughs> I mean, exactly <laughs> oh, no you... no we draw the line there <laughs> <laughs> because we say you're a human being first before any of that crap goes yeah, on yeah, yeah. We love you. That's the yeah. given. That is what we do. We give gift that to you. And because we love you, we respect you. And because we love you, we trust you. And it's up to you to lose that. Yeah. And if we could all connect across the planet in that space of love, 
then anything is possible. Yeah. But I go back to what you were saying earlier, that it's, it's what's within your control, what's within your, your circle of influence. And if you can only control yourself and connect to yourself and love yourself, mm. then you can start loving other people. If you connect to your family and you understand the, the essence of collaboration and the, the power of collaboration, then that is good enough. So my philosophy, if somebody comes into the community and they are impacted by what one person says, well, then that's job done, that's it. But actually, if everybody is being love, everybody's being collaboration, and they are acting in accordance with the culture that we are creating together, then that's gonna have the ripple effect. You can't not have a ripple effect of spreading out to everybody around the world in order to change the paradigm that we're currently living in. Mm. The paradigm of fear and scarcity and competition you know, one politician says one thing, there's 10 of them that are going to shout him down. You know, what, <clears throat> all the people at the top seem to have a vested interest in keeping it exactly the way it is. What if the groundswell was a culture of love that the people at the top would then pretty much be redundant because what they're looking for is how much money can we make? You know, what's the bottom line? How much profits have been made this year? Apparently this year was the first year in its lifetime that Marks and Spencers didn't make a profit. I'm like, and? how many other businesses didn't make a profit that's not a bad thing to say you know but it's like oh it's the end of the world Marks and Spencers are going to go out of business well really <laughs> you know it's just kind and, of changing. And if they do... but changing the way the world views stuff it's all this mm. scarcity we haven't got enough we need to consume more we need to you know have more things no we don't come on and the pandemic has shown us more clearly that what's important in the world is the glue that keeps the country running it's the people at the coal face the the people that load the supermarket shelves the people that do our deliveries the people that look after us when we're not well and um, those are the people that should be valued uh, and when we transform into a paradigm of love connection and abundance then we can start seeing those and what you've illustrated by by saying about people's purpose it's a beautiful way to understand what your purpose is understand that we're all in this together and find out that all you've got to impact is you first and foremost and see a new way of being and then take it out to the people that are near to you and then see what happens. And yeah. ma magic happens. It's just... This is a really interesting, uh, really, really interesting discussion that we're having because like I'm bringing it a context of having worked clinically and worked in a rehab center right and, mm -hmm. I, and I was and when I say worked I was an intern in a rehab center but it was powerful right mm -hmm. and you're seeing people at their most broken and thinking that's not me well it is you right most people I talk to have a big big story people you think they're doing really well some of them are really struggling in yeah. fact most of our really successful people and you know I'm getting phone calls from people who are super successful who aren't coping right oh. so so as a principle of of many mental health and clinical health is at the heart of it is a thing called a perceived ability to cope mm -hmm. right and if you want to if you want an example of that at the extreme uh i think there's a box set of um sas uh, yeah PTSD, <laughs> right? and that's yeah. that's that's your perceived ability put to cope push to the extreme yes right? but most of us deal with this thing called the perceived ability to cope and when you get in a rehab Center. a lot of people don't believe they have that so when you say you need to be kind to yourself and you love yourself um consciously right what the hell is that about and unconsciously don't believe it mm -hmm. right because the, the 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 recording sessions you've done between the ages of one to eight has been i'm not lovable i'm not lovable i can't i don't believe it right mm -hmm. so consciously it doesn't get in we mm -hmm. we address it as a thought right so when somebody says, I love myself, can you look in the mirror, the mirror test, look in the mirror and say, oh, I love you. You know, I love yeah. you. you know, it's a really, really hard thing for a lot of people because they don't yeah. feel they love themselves. Yeah. And so therefore they can't give what they don't feel they've got. Exactly. Mm. Right. Um, so again, as a tip, you know, I put down loving dad because I know, I know what that feels like. A mm. loving friend. I know what that feels like. It's in yeah. my. It's in the. It's in the the DNA, right? It's in the. It's the the program got in. It got rewritten. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so a starting point for a lot of people like that is even if you say I can't love myself, say I like myself, mm. and see what comes up. Right? Small steps, isn't it? Because because I see people say I want to do good out there. I want to push it out to the world. Yeah. But the problem with that is if you're not a loving person trying to be loving, people see it for what it is. 
Mm. Right? They say, mm. well, that's not loving, right? But but that's why I say start with your world, and your world might be, as you said, really aptly. You know, you, you know, start with yourself. It's a yeah. really nice place to start. Right? Um, I'm going to give you another tool, and I'll throw this, and you might want to take a screenshot of this. Okay. I yeah. wish I invented this, but I didn't. Oh, I know. <laughs> I've seen that before. Yeah. You've seen it before. Love right? it. This yeah. Is, this is the work of Robert Diltz, and and. It, it, sometimes when someone's talking, it's how it, it, you can hear where they're talking from, right? You can hear where they're talking from. When we talk about COVID and Marks and Spencers and the fear and thing, that's all about circumstances. It's what's happening in the external world, right? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people, when they're trying to change their life, they're trying to change circumstances. Yeah, the right? stuff, yeah. Yeah. And then you come up to behaviours if I want to change my circumstances, I've got to do something. What do I need to be doing differently? You know, and importantly, what do I need to start doing, stop doing, or continue doing? Mm. And, you know, this year, good thing is what do I need to let go of this year? And what do I need to keep? Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what do I need to stop doing? What do I need to start doing? What do I need to continue doing? I draw the line at mince pies though. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You don't need to do that. No. No. And, and if you're, if you're doing something, what am I doing, right? Mm-hmm. And this, this is this is where do I do this? When do I do this? With whom? For those of you that are listening to this, by the way, um, just to say, there's a ladder, and uh, Andrew's got at the bottom of the ladder is circumstances, and he's moved up to behaviours. We've got skills, beliefs, identity, clari- identity, identity, and intention. And yeah. intention. So at the bottom of the ladder, we've got circumstances. The yep. next level up, we've got behaviour, which is all about what. What am I doing? You know, mm. What do I need to be doing here? So when people are asking what questions, they're really talking about changing their behavior. How do I do that is about skills. So the clue there is how. But how do I do that, Jill? Mm. They really don't have the skill. That's telling you I lack the skill. How do I mm. do that, Jill? How do I be more loving? So how do I be more loving? How do I be? The, how does the behavior show up? I don't know how to make that behavior show up. Yes. So we're moving up the ladder. If you're, if you're, if you're on the wireless, <laughs> it's, the, it's Christmas time and we're doing the neurological levels with Jill and Andy. <laughs> and we're moving up that ladder. <laughs> <laughs> so give that man a coconut, Grandma. Let's move on. <laughs> You're showing your age now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The 1940s, the, the reels, right? right? Yeah. Um, so the skills, what what skills do I need? Right. And then for me, there's a there's like this big uh, big jump. This made so much sense. change my life in just listening to people. How do you listen to someone? And and so most people who are struggling in life, mm-hmm. you know, they come to a meeting. Oh, teach me this skill. Teach me this yeah, behavior. That teach will me make these all my problems go away. And that'll yeah. change my life. And they but they're usually starting at the bottom, trying to change circumstances. And if it's not changing, it tells me there's something wrong with their behaviors. And if it's and if their behaviors are wrong, it tells me they haven't got the skills to change it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But if you go then up to the next level, the belief and the values is what drives skill, because otherwise you wouldn't learn the skill. Yeah. So exactly. you wouldn't do the work. You wouldn't say, "I need to be." Why do you? Why do you want to be more loving? Because I believe. What do I? What would I need to believe to show up as more loving? Right. So we then that fourth step up is what do I need to believe? Right? Why do I need to believe that? And this is where we get into, I can't, it's a good idea, but I can't. So this, I don't want to give myself permission to. Mm, too scary. And, and clinically, we talk about the secondary gain. There's, if you're doing something that you know is, it, 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 all behavior is purposeful and it's certainly resourceful, but it may not be appropriate. So if you're doing something that's inappropriate, there's a secondary gain to doing that. Oh, I can't make a lot of money. So that means I don't have to think about making a lot of money. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's the purpose of that? Mm. So, so the difference between Freud and I think Adler was that um, Freud was on about causation. Why do you do this? He asked why, 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 why? Whereas Adler would say, what's the purpose of that? Okay, so this is why gratitude is such a wonderful thing because mm-hmm. this thing happened to me this year, but what was the purpose of that? What did I learn from that? What, did I, what could I be grateful about? It's a totally different orientation to why did that happen to me? Which is victim yeah, stuff. Victim, right? yeah. And then above, if we go up to level five, the, the, level, the next level up is identity. Who am I when I'm being loving? Mm. Right? So if I'm a victim, can you be loving if your identity is victim? No. Right? 
No. And then <coughs> ultimately this top one is intention. And intention is every one of these steps has a purpose behind it. What's the purpose of being someone who's allergic to money? I, I can't make money. What's the purpose of that? Mm. Right? That's the that's the purpose of that step. But intention is about doing something a lot, lot bigger than you, greater than you. So you go into rehab and do the 12 steps programs. And they talk about you're not going to, if you could fix this, if you could change your circumstances, if you could change the behavior, if you had the skills and the beliefs and the identity, why are you still drinking? Why are you still doing drugs? If you knew how to fix this, you would have fixed it. Mm. And if you're running the planet and the world and the universe, tell me how you're doing that. Right. That's one of the questions they confront you with. If you're if you're in charge of the universe, tell me how you're doing that. Right. If you're God, <laughs> tell me how you're doing that. Right. So intention in the 12 steps program is what's greater than me. Mm. What's a power greater than me? Whatever that is, whatever you perceive that to be, it's got to be a lot, lot bigger than you. And a bigger intention, like you talked about a huge intention of, of a loving planet that we align to that. It's a lot bigger than all of us. Mm. So, and that intention then cascades downwards. If that's your intention, mm -hmm. it changes your identity, who you're being. So then you can, who I'm being is driven by that identity change. You can't show up here if you haven't changed that. Mm. Right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So the collaboration is an intention. Right? Yes. And then you come down to uh, beliefs. What would I need to believe if I believed in collaboration? So yeah. you work it back down as well. So this... To change anything down here, it's a, it's a lot easier if you start with intention. Why am I changing that? What's the big thing I'm going for here? So for me, um, loving dad was a was not just a, a a loving dad, but how does loving dad show up in the world? You know, it, with people. How am I around people? For what reason? Because um, you know, you mentioned it before, uh, Jill. You know, we're here for a reason. We're here. Mm. We're here to do something. Um, Carl Rogers. Uh, who I really admire, pinpoints a time in the 60s, you know, the, the one of, if, if you're watching this on the wireless, I'm holding up a CD called The Music of the 60s, <laughs> the wireless. But if you're watching this on, on the television or the video, <laughs> I'm holding up the CD, right? But the 60s, um, and I'm going, I'm going back to my dad. I've got a lot to be grateful for with my dad. But you've got to remember, he signed up at 18. Mm to fight a conflict because that's what he felt drawn to serve, right? Mm. He didn't feel good about it. And in my discussions with him, he didn't feel good about it, right? But it was the right thing to do. Mm. And in the 60s, we flipped that around, which is I, if I do good, I'll feel good. And they flipped it around to I first have to feel good before I do good. Mm. And we'd been on that tra trajectory for at least 60 years. Yeah. And we can pinpoint it back to the 60s, right, where it became about me and not about others. And you've got to think the, uh, you know, I'm proud of my daddy, the service he gave to queen and country and king and country, right, for the king's shilling. Quite important. That's a, that, you know, you're fighting alongside guys who he lost mates standing right next to him, right? That's mm. a huge sacrifice. Mm. And where collaboration is about, you know, who's standing next to me? Who am I supporting? If you're doing this on your own, you're doing it wrong. Mm straight up and down we're getting real deep now aren't we i know but you know it is it's that time of year yeah. when you realize that everyone's reflecting back on a year with a pandemic and everyone can see that most people have been touched by death in some way through oh, this. totally yeah and we have to kind of acknowledge that we can't keep doing what we've been doing no. um not just with a result of uh, stopping the pandemic but just in life in general you know the the politics isn't working the education system isn't working the monetary system isn't working it's mm. like how what else can we do to actually make everybody's life better you, you know i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna um i'm gonna challenge you on a point there okay. i'm gonna challenge you right i'm not gonna agree with you on this one i, I, th I, I think the world works wonderfully mm -hmm. most of the time and if nothing else, the pandemic has taught me just how wonderful people can be. Yeah. And, and the Brits in a crisis, we're talking about the 1940s. You've got to think, you've got to think that Neville Chamberlain or, or whoever was the prime minister at the time when, when, when war was declared on this country, or actually we wasn't declared on, we declared war on Germany and Poland, right? In the we did 1940s, indeed. right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, for all his faults, there was one person who gave a speech who 
who changed a parliamentary decision to acquiesce, mm. right? And that was, that was uh, Winston Churchill. And he said, I don't know how we're going to do it. Well, we're not going to give up. We're not going to give in, right? And it, it coalesced a nation and Brits, if you don't know, oh, I come from another country, but the thing you learn about Brits is number one, I don't care what people say, this is probably the most relational people on the planet Earth. Right? It's, it's an insult that we go to Americans to learn how to be relational. <laughs> yeah. Right? right? It's yeah. an insult. The Brits are the most relational people on the planet, right? If you want to find that out, you find out who your neighbours are in a pandemic. And my neighbours have just been amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the, the care that we have for one another. So, and the world works just fine if you let people crack on with it. I've seen, exactly. I know through my team at, at Clear Sky, we've got people, therapists, right, who are going into places like really, really bad, bad, high, high COVID issues with people yeah. who, you know, bless them, don't have the sense that God gave them, who, uh, off their face on drugs, send their children to school with COVID. Our people looking after those kids and they get COVID and they can't be with their own families because mm -hmm. someone can't look after themselves. Right? Mm. But it, they make it work. Mm. And our charities made something that's just untenable work. And, you know, it's the 1940s. The Brits made it work. Yeah, I think it's a time and a place. But for my, my philosophy is that 99% of the population are awesome people exactly yeah. um and we've got the one percent that is generally ruling uh dictatoring or whatever they are doing um oxfam figures give us don't they is it less than one percent of the population hold more wealth than yeah. over half the rest of the population yeah. well on what planet is that fair you know uh, and my my upbringing my um i realized from a very young age that you know any ism wasn't quite good for me. Sexism, racism, ageism, no, no. it's just not, and I don't, anything that's not fair. So the Black Lives Matter thing, why should we still be talking about that now? It should have been sorted in the 1950s, 1960s. Whoa, didn't we have, didn't we have the civil rights movement to sort that? Exactly. I mean, I was reading an article today about um, how the school system was segregated and how they were trying, the law had been passed, they weren't supposed to be segre segregated, so they were desegregating. And nine... Uh, black children went into school with armed guards from the national uh, forces because the locals were saying that they didn't want them there. And it's like, you know, these people, where is your logic? Where is your common sense? So historically, you know, the fact that we're all on the same planet and we, it seems to be we're more segregated and more separate now because of the, um, the right and the, um, the way things are going. Uh, and it is media that is driving this behind us because I think, as I say, 99% of people are good, are kind, will come up when the, they need to, but they're feeling isolated. They're feeling they're at home, they're working home alone. They're looking at all the diatribe that's on social media and it is just pulling, sucking them into this negative space that we'll, we'll self implode if we're not careful. Yeah, but, but see, again, if we look at this, Mm. Is circumstances dictating my beliefs? Yeah. Right? Now, uh, I was always taught, if you don't like it, turn it off. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Don't read the newspaper. One of our things on KPI is stop reading the newspaper because yeah, you're getting an education in how life sucks. Yeah. But life doesn't suck. Yeah. Look but this is telling you. more and more people this. I mean, you, you and I wouldn't dream of, of getting sucked into this kind of thing, but I have a goddaughter who's 16 and, oh, you know, yeah. get her off of Instagram. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, uh, as a resource for anybody watching this, go on and search for Course Era, C O U R S, Course E R A, Course Era. It's the Yale University, the Science of Wellbeing. It's a twelve-week course. It's free. Brilliant. And the one big takeaway from that is the more time you spend on social media, the more prone you are to depression and anxiety. Of course, it's because common. the way the brain is hardwired is to compare. And we give bias to the other person and we give bias to the news and we give bias to influential yeah. people. If you stop that, you get time to pause. You hit pause. Um, I also think nature is a wonderful thing. I'm looking again at that backdrop behind I was you. just going to say that. Yeah, you have to go to places like this. So just, yeah, to be, yeah. just go and for a walk. Look at these little houses, these tiny little houses mm. sitting on the edge of the earth with a massive ocean that could any time. have been there so, for hundreds of years. You yeah. know what? I'm just going to dump on you, right? 
And so nature, I think, has put us on the naughty step. Yeah. Right. And, I agree. And, and I hate to say this because coming from a harsh climate like Australia, right, if it comes down to you and nature, nature always wins, yep. right? I was talking to a mate of mine who shot a video on the, the great Amazon desert. Mm. Right? He shot the video from the great Amazon desert, right? Um, it's an obscenity. The yeah. Amazon does, as it does not exist. It's a rainforest. But he's, he's a guy who looked at the, the he's a guy who was a, a, a land management guy who the great deserts of northern Africa were once rainforesty, right? And he's talking about the great desert of the Amazon. Once it's gone, folks, it's gone, right? Yep. But you can pull it back from the brink at any mm -hmm. time you choose. It's an obscenity that people make money out of bulldozing the oxygen of the planet, mm. right? Mother Nature says, okay, let me just see how good you are with this. How does that, how's that working out for you guys? Okay, we'll just see how long it takes you for, to get the message. This is not a good strategy. And that's, mm -hmm. I think COVID has given us that massive opportunity. Yes. Now, how do you then implement that in your world? Walk down your street, you see rubbish, pick it up. Mm, exactly. Um, I did a study, uh, and it's, a, it's not my study, but, a, but we did a test on this on litter picking in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. And I did a study in my own community, start where, you know, remember it was think globally, act locally. Remember that was the yeah, yeah. 1960s and 70s, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a forest behind my place and you'd walk through it and there's just rubbish everywhere. And so I started picking up rubbish and I thought, I can't do this on my own. If I, every single day there's more rubbish. And I realized I can't do this on my own. Mm -hmm. you, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you now, listening. Mm -hmm. You can't do this <laughs> on your own. And you, I'm looking at you too. Okay? And you, you can't do this on your own. This is why you need to talk to Jill and me, right? <laughs> See? And people would say, what are you picking up rubbish for? You didn't put that there. That, well, someone has to, right? Yep. So I then went around to my friends in the neighbourhood and I said, listen, we're going to do a litter pick through the woods because I walk up there with my dogs. And, mm. and uh, do you want to come and help me? And all I want is 40 minutes of your time. Bring some bags and litter pick. We pulled 27 bags of rubbish out of that woods. Wow. We said, let's meet in three months and do it again. We had such a great time connecting and bonding. We found people in a neighborhood we didn't even realize there. Young people, old people, black people, white people, gay people, straight people, transgender people, disabled people. It, it was just <laughs> people, Australians, people. even Australians <laughs> rocked up, right? right? It was just wonderful. As a community, we thought, oh, shoot, I didn't know you lived down the street. I didn't yeah. know you we got to connect, right? We're having a lot of fun. You could hear laughter in the woods, right? Oh, that's lovely. Three months later, we picked nine bags of rubbish. Mm. Three months later, we picked one bag, one bag of rubbish. Wow. Right? There you go. It's called the broken window effect, and it's yeah. well documented. If you see a, a place with graffiti and broken windows, you're getting social reinforcement. Ah, that's what we do here. When you repair the windows, remove the graffiti, pick up the rubbish, people go, oh, we don't drop litter here. We don't break stuff here. Mm -hmm. And that's a community thing. And you do that in your own world. So where I live, I walk down the street with my litter picker and I go down the country lanes and I'm always picking up rubbish. Yep. And I notice people go out walking, they've got a little bag and they pick up rubbish. They've got their gloves, they pick up rubbish. You walk through our woods, you walk up our country streets, there's no litter anywhere. Yeah. yeah. In our little village, right? And we don't know who started it. We don't know how it happened, but we just don't litter here. Yeah, exactly. And and that was something that we were told as kids, you take your litter home with you, you don't yeah. drop it anywhere. Um, but it's the same principle when people say, uh, oh, everyone on the tube is really grumpy and, and nobody talks to each other. Nobody, you know, on the yeah. British tube. I thought, well, when I go on the British tube, they do. I, I have most yeah. conversations yeah. on the tube. Me too, me too. Uh, it's like, well, if you go and smile at someone, they'll smile back at you. But I've been in rehab, so... <laughs> you talk to anyone no, i talk to anybody yeah but then so do i i mean different times i've been out with my kids we go to the theater a lot yeah. and they, they like to well so do i sometimes wait at the stage door and say thank you that was a great show and there's usually a little crowd of people and i heard once we kind of got separated and i was chatting to these nice people and uh, someone had said to my daughter oh your mother's at it again and i didn't realize but and they went, oh yeah that's what she does I said, what do you mean that's what i do you talk to everyone yeah I said, well, how do you get to know people? It's lovely. You, you meet some amazing people just by having a nice chat. And then you maybe go for a drink or whatever it is. But it's just like you spread a little bit of sunshine. 
And if that's picking up litter and it, whatever it's doing, just walking down the road, we've all had to go out for walks for our daily exercise. Talk yeah. to the people, they're your neighbours. Really bugs me when I say to people, what's your neighbour's name? What do you mean? Dunno. What's your neighbour's name? Uh, well, we've only just moved in. How long have you lived there? Oh, only about 18 months. And you don't know your neighbour's name. Yeah. How can, I mean, when I was a kid, I knew everybody up and down my street and it was a League of Nations. We were in the East End of London. I would walk to school at the age of five. Um, I only had one road to cross, which was fine. And, you know, I, I used to go to the park with my aunt who was blind um, and she was, I was her eyes and she was my responsible adult when I was like three and four years of age. But we knew people. It's the East End of London, but we, there were people that you knew along the way. And my mum was, if there's any, if you're ever worried about anything, you go to this house, this house, this house, because they were our friends. They were our neighbours. Um, and it, it's sad. And that's what Collaboration Global is about, first and foremost. It's that community where you can be pants. You can say you've had a bad day. You can say you need some help. You can say, you know, this has gone wrong. I tried this and it failed. And because there's other people there that go, oh, okay, how can I help? What can I do? So, you know, you go to a networking event and it's like, well, what's in this for me? Like, what can I get out of this? But if you come to Collaboration Global, the, the culture is, oh, brilliant. I like what you're doing. How can I help? What can I do? How can I support you? And it's, See, that's it's, positive and healthy. It should be the norm, shouldn't it? Yeah, it's, it should. it's a, that's a positive, healthy approach to life. You know, life is pants. Life, life throws you curveballs, right? To pretend it doesn't happen. And I think that's what's happened with COVID. Because we've got onto Zoom, mm. right, we've amplifying however you're being, and you mentioned how you're being, that's getting amplified. Yes. Right. So if you're an idiot, you, you're a bigger idiot right now. Right? Yeah. If, if, um, if, you're, if it's about you, that's getting amplified. Mm. Mm. yeah so so the collaboration you know um how do you know it's working how do you know it's working in this community you're talking about because of the stories that you hear um i mean a classic story is which i love is one guy um mentioned this was when we used to meet face to face but it's not not dissimilar to other things that have happened but he mentioned that he wasn't talking to his dad because they haven't spoken for seven years but that's fine i'm okay with that that's all right and a few of us went Ooh. <clears throat> so bit by bit by bit, we'd nudge and nudge and nudge. Um, and he, we recommended a, a course, personal development course for him to go on. And a few of us turned up on the course to support him. Uh, but we surrounded him. We love bombed him, basically. And eventually he went, all right, all right. And he picked the phone up and he had a conversation. And as a result of that conversation, he introduced his dad to his children that he'd never met before. So the kids didn't even know they had a granddad. And so all of a sudden they had a granddad. And they had that granddad for another year before he died. Now, if he hadn't been part of Collaboration Global, he quite freely says it never would have happened. That to me is the part of the community is that we, we challenge you, you want you to be your best. Um, and yeah, we, I can give you massive stories about people that have earned, oh yeah, I, I earned a 200K contract because of Collaboration Global. Oh yeah, I put 26K bottom line on my every month, blah, blah. I don't care about that. It's those other stories about uh, an alcoholic who'd been a functioning alcoholic all of his adult life until he came to Collaboration Global and he's now been dry, sober for three years. Those are the sorts of stories I'm talking about because it expects everyone to live up to the boats in the, in the harbour <laughs> all rise at the same time when, when you're all helping and supporting each other. And, that's and you've got a that. safe haven too. You've got that safe port. Yes, yes. And it's got, a buffer, against the, it's got a buffer against the big, a big ocean. Yeah, we're incredibly fragile. Yeah. The reality is we're incredibly fragile. Yeah. Um, I'm taken from this so far. It's bringing up a lot for me, but, but what you say is really important. You know, it's to me, loving is a, is a quality that I, I try and bring. It might be different next year. I might go looking for a different adjective next year. But, <laughs> it's a but, pretty good one you've chosen so far. But I talk with a lot of people who you're a long time in regret. Oh, yeah. If you have the chance to pick up the phone and talk to someone, I've got a mate of mine or a client of mine who hasn't spoken to his mum for 35 years. <gasps> Ouch. 35 oh. years. Right? That's stubborn. <laughs> yeah, that's angry. <laughs> yeah. That's anger, right? That's just, that's just, oh, I'm not angry with mum. I said, bull, BS, you are. Mm. Right? Tracking. That's happened in 35 years, right? He's got a fit. And, and the fact that I've got to tell you to pick the phone up, mm -hmm. shame on you. Mm. shame on you grow up push through you know so here's the thing you know 
we're talking about li- uh, loneliness and isolation. Yeah. Yeah, we're 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 in our cells, <laughs> but they haven't cut off communication. No. Right. I, you know, uh, I love going to see my grandkids and my kids because I get lots of hugs. You know, but that's not enough. You know, sometimes I want more contact, and there's nothing yeah. like being face to face with someone. But that season will pass. Yes. Right. We're, so, what can I be grateful for about that? I've had time to time to think. Again, another. This is my third tool here. Okay. Get a big piece of paper, and for the people on the wireless, <laughs> we, I've drawn a, on a piece of paper. I've drawn some concentric circles, with you right in the middle of the smaller circle, and then level one is who are the people closest to you that that they're in the inner circle. They're the the people you love and trust, and put their names in there. Then you've probably got friends, and then you've got people out there, right? And then it might be the next circle. There's people I know of, but I haven't been in contact with for a while. Right? Reach out. Mm. Send them a message. If you haven't spoken to someone in your family for a long time and you've got every reason not to, mm-hmm. reach out anyway. Yeah. Reach out anyway. Grow up. You know, push through it. Now, they might tell you to, you know, bugger off. doesn't matter. But the point is you reached out. It's more about it's 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 what it teaches you to do that. What's you know, I look at what holds us back. Mm-hmm. What's holding you back? And people invent amazing stories for why oh, they can't yeah. do stuff. We love stories. Ultimately, if you forgive them it, without them having to say sorry, just forgive them for what's happened, whatever it is, just forgive them. In your heart, forgive yourself for oh, allowing that's it the to first go one. on. Forgive yourself, start with, yeah. And then, then picking the phone up is not so difficult. Um, and it's just, you have no idea how much that will mean to them. Even if they don't acknowledge it, they'll yeah. put the phone down afterwards and they will feel loved. And so, so your guy, your guy super, probably um, had a good reason for not talking to his dad. Mm-hmm. Good reason. Oh yeah. Millions of but, them. But you know, he, he, you extended grace to that man for 12 months. You gave that man grace yeah. for 12 months, right? Grace is a wonderful thing. Grace is, is a gift not earned. Mm. That's what grace is all about. You, you know, I, it's not what you earn. It's not what you did. It's not the car you drive. It's, it's you get this gift in spite of all that. And that's, that's the power of grace. Grace gives you that, right? Yeah. There but by the grace of God go I is a wonderful expression. And I'm named after that church down on that, that bluff head there, right? That's <laughs> and my mum was a Salvation Army. She was in the Salvation Army, right? And I used to give mum stick. Oh. oh, lots of stick. Mum, what are you doing? Like tambourine, take it somewhere else. Oh. Like what a loser. I gave her such stick about it, right? But she put on a uniform. And she used to go down the pubs and gather money and, and Great woman. did that every, very weekend. Uh, she had a lot of bikey mates who she'd go into these rough pubs that no one would go into. She went in, she said, come on, empty your pockets, boys. And <laughs> I love <laughs> <Right>? your mum. <laughs> oh, she, she, was, she was wonderful. She was wonderful. She had a lot of, I had a lot of fun with my mum and I had a lot of laughs, right? Well, listen, Andrew, that, this has kind of brought us full circle because we started talking about your dad and St. Yeah. Ives and your mum and how you got named yeah. at the beginning. And this has been a fascinating conversation. And not only have you been sharing about who you are, but you've been giving us some tools that we can use yeah. to find out more about who we are as well. Yeah. I just thank you so much for coming. I've had a great time. I could be here yeah. all morning, but I know some people have done their jog and they've listened to them and they've got to get on with their life. So maybe they can listen to part two. Maybe we'll do part, part two. two yeah, we day. come back to part two. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, I bang on about stuff, that's for sure. But uh, Merry Christmas. If you can, Clear Sky Children's Charity, if you can, even more importantly, give something to crisis. Crisis needs. I've, I've slept rough, so I, I, crisis is dear to my heart. Nine yeah. quid will change someone's life this Christmas. Salvation Army is very dear to my heart because of my mum, which is why I raised it. So if you can give something to the Salvos, they do an amazing job for families at this time of year and God knows they need it. Brilliant. If somebody wanted to get in touch with you, Andrew, what's the easiest way for them to? Just LinkedIn. Go on LinkedIn. Just go LinkedIn. That's how you reach me. And Priestley with L-E-Y on LinkedIn. L-E-Y or andrewpriestley.com. But but, uh, if you go to andrewpriestley.com, I'm going to try and sell you something, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Don't go there then. (laughs) Here comes my wife. Here comes my cell. Yeah. yeah. So so stay away from andrewpriestley.com because I'm going to sell you something, right? And who knows, um, if you you come to the uh, Collaboration Global meeting uh, on the 26th of January, um, then if people can't fancy coming to meet Andrew, maybe he'll be on that meeting as well. We could drag him along. It'll be good. It'll be Australia Day. 
Oh, really? Well, there's more reason for it to come then. 26th of Australia, 26th of January is Australia Day. Did that's not when know the that. Brits, that's when the Brits settled at Australia. Ah, fantastic. So if anybody wants to find tickets to that, we're on Eventbrite, uh, or you can find it through collaborationglobal.org. Yeah. Uh, if anyone wants to have a chat with me, you can reach me on jill at collaborationglobal.org. Org, or obviously LinkedIn as well. That's Jill. Hey, hey, Jill, I like you. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> I like you. Bonus. <laughs> it's, it's been an absolute delight. It's a delight to chat. It, and I, I feel really privileged to, to get to bend the ear of your, of your, your audience. Um, I wish you Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah. Um, if you see Jill, she needs lots of hugs, okay? If you see her in Absolutely. person, just make a form a big, long line to give Jill a hug. Okay? <laughs> when we're allowed. When we're, when when we're, allowed. <laughs> when we're Still allowed. safely, but when you always, or just send her a hug right now from your heart, right? Oh. Just send a lot of, just send her a bit of love. So you just close your eyes and see Jill's lovely face and send her a hug, yeah? <laughs> well, here's a hug from me to you. There we go. There's one from me too. I've really you. enjoyed this session today. Um, having known of you and around you and briefly spoken to you, this has been a fantastic conversation. Hopefully, uh, be many more to come as well. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for joining us. Merry Christmas, folks. You too. Take care. God, Merry Christmas. God bless. Bye. Bye.